I want to um, just briefly give a word of hope. In this passage here we find, uh, in, according to the Gospel of John, the healing at the pool of Bethesda. We are so grateful to the Lord for every miracle that takes place, that took place, and in St. John there are very selective miracles. He did not choose to point out all the miracles that Jesus did, but rather that the miracles that he selected by the Spirit were pointing to Jesus as the Son of God and revealing uh, his identity. Jesus loves us. And uh, the Bible says after this, actually after this last miracle of the nobleman, uh, child that got healed, his son, he had sent those to Jesus Christ um, when he was into Galilee, came into Galilee. And the place where he had made the water wine, that was his first miracle. And so the word had spread now what Jesus had, had done. So when he came back into Galilee, into Cana, the word had spread. And so now here, uh, this nobleman had a son that was very sick. He sent word to him by his servants and asked Jesus to come down to his house and pray for his son. And Jesus said, uh, except you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. And so his word was, sir, come down before my child died. He was pleading. And so Jesus obviously saw the faith. And he said, go your way, your son's living. Your son is going to live, whatever. And the man left, but he believed what Jesus said. Went his way. But as he was going back home, uh, his servants met him on the way. When he met them, they said, your son is living. He says, oh, yeah, well, what, what, uh, when did he start to amend? They said, yesterday about the seventh hour. And so he knew that that was the very time when Jesus said, your son's living. And uh, so that was the miracle uh, that took place. And it was after uh, the Bible says, this, verse 54, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Then after this, there was a feast to the, of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, some, there's speculation as to what feast this was. There were certain feasts that were what, we, what they call pilgrimage feasts, where they would move from wherever they were, whatever country they were, and they would head to Jerusalem for these major feasts, like Feast of Pentecost and uh, some of the others. It was about three major feasts. And those feasts, they would always head to Jerusalem during that time. Other feasts, they didn't necessarily head to Jerusalem. So it's recorded three feasts, three different feasts, major feasts, um, in John, and they were interpreting the length of Jesus' tenure here by the annual feasts that took place. And uh, so they are not sure. Some believe this was a fourth feast. And if it was, it would have put Jesus at three and a half years. But if it wasn't, then it would put Jesus at three years. It's debatable. That's not the important thing. The important thing was it was a feast where people came together. And said, now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. And this... Uh, better interpreted the sheep gate. There were several gates, uh, just like the wall of Jerusalem. They, the, the wall was surrounding Jerusalem, and there were different gates. And this was on the north gate. And on the north gate, uh, which led right into the temple, 
And it was also where they did, uh, it led to uh, the, where they sacrificed the sheep and animals. And so it was on this north gate. And there was a, a, a pool, and surrounding this pool were five porches. And on those porches, just surrounded, there was just a lot of impotent folk. Sick, halt, blind, lame, paralyzed. Just a lot of people that were sick. And then it tells in verse 3, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, or lame, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. This was significant, the moving of the water. Then verse 4 explains why. One angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Now, there is also mythical speculations as well as to uh, whether an angel really did that or not, or it was just some, uh, some belief that they had. But the Bible says an angel went down. Isn't that right? So that's what we choose to believe. Angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, you see that there was an array of hope, right? Uh, for all kinds of sick people, the truth about it is some would never be healed through that method. But it still brought hope, right? Just the idea that maybe, just maybe by chance, I might be able to get into, to be one of those that's first into the pool. And I don't know if it was first, just one only, or whether it was just a few people who dived in at the same time, I don't know. But anyway, it says, whoever first uh, hit the pool uh, were made totally whole of whatever disease they had. And in spite of Israel's state, God in his great mercy still loved Israel, right? Now, the, 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 the pool was called Bethesda. It's actually Bethesda, the way it's elaborated. It's not Bethesda, how we often pronounce it. But then that's not the important thing. The pool, uh, the name of that, uh, that means house of mercy. That's what the pool meant, the name of the pool meant. House of mercy. All right? Now, in the Old Testament, in the ark, there was a lid, there was a, called the mercy seat, right? And thank God it was called the mercy seat, because had it not been a mercy seat, it would have been a judgment seat. So that mercy seat depicted Jesus, right? It depicted Jesus, and it pointed to the future of what Christ was going to do, die on the cross. God was going to have mercy. Jesus is God's mercy manifested, and he was going to die on the cross for the sins of all humanity. And so here was a, a pool that offered hope. Now we move into verse 5 and it says, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. You know what's interesting? This church is 38 years old. Now isn't that interesting? You think we got infirmities? <laughs> All right. But this is what, look what it says. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in that case or condition, he said to him, will thou be made whole? Do you want to get well? The impotent man answered, 
In some translations it says, I can't. Or, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step it down before me. Can you imagine how frustrating that was? You know, there's, there's about three things I want to point out, but before I do, uh, how many find yourself in a situation that's frustrating? <laughs> Ain't nobody saying that. I mean, frustrating. Here's a guy, he was lame or had an infirmity. There was hope for his problem. So he, but there was another problem. And which brings me to the first point that the Lord kind of, I believe it was him that pointed out. The first thing I saw was what it took for, or what it took to get healing from the pool. This is what it took. It was indeed a place where God was merciful and they could get some help. Now, not everybody was going to get some help, right? But somebody could get some help. That's mercy, but it's not to the degree that the mercy that we know and God wants us to understand today. It's not a few that can get help from God. But he said, it's like what it took to get healing in the pool during that time. This is what it took. It took a person being alert, alertness, right? Because the water would bubble up, would begin to bubble after the troubling of the angel. So if a person had their back turned and weren't paying any mind, by the time they would see or hear the commotion and try to go there, Somebody had seen it because they were more alert. They got into the pool, right? So they had to be alert if they were going to get some poop, get some healing. They had to also be swift, not only alert. Because if you were the first one to see it, oh, and you were lame, you still might not make it. Y'all say, well, where are you going with all that, you know? I'm showing what it took for all those impotent folk if they were going to get a miracle what it took for them to get it. It was indeed a pool of mercy. But they still had to qualify to get the help. So they had to be alert, watchful. They had to be Swift and move swiftly when they saw the water was trouble, right? And they also had to hang around the pool. That's right. Amen. right? Because if they decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to go home for, for a while, I'm kind of tired. The angel could come then and trouble the water. When they came back, they're hearing, yeah, well, that water just got stirred and somebody just got healed. So it was another season before it ever got stirred again. That season could have been a couple of times a year. It could have been one time a year, but it was a season. Some of them tend to believe that it was an annual thing, but it didn't say that. But the point is, it was at a certain season, but there still was hope, right? Now, the other thing that I saw, although there was, it was a pool or house of mercy, there was a long potential waiting period. All right? It was a season. It didn't happen back to back. It didn't happen the next month. It didn't happen the next week. It was a certain season when the angel would come down and trouble the waters. So if you miss it the first time or two, it could be a few years before you got any help. 
then you had to be alert and you had to be swift. So it did offer some hope. Look at somebody say, but it did offer some hope. Third thing I saw was the hopelessness of some. Some were waiting in vain because they were never going to get any help at that pool. How frustrating is that? How frustrating is that? Does anybody feel like I'm saved, I pray, but I'm, I'm not getting no help. And I don't know if things ever going to change. Oh, quiet on me now. Yeah, I'm trying to. So, the hopelessness of some waiting. Those that were blind, if they couldn't hear on top of their blindness, they were in double trouble, right? Because the water could be stirred and they wouldn't know it unless they heard something. But if they were blind and the water didn't make a lot of noise but it just bubbled, they couldn't see it. There was a certain hopelessness for the blind. Then there were the lame, those that couldn't walk even though they saw it. If they didn't have some relative or some friend or somebody to help them when they saw the waters, then they still couldn't be the first to get there and they wouldn't get the help even though they could see it. Then there were the paralyzed. So it was a hopeful situation for some, but some others, it was no hope. So Jesus comes down to the pool. Have you ever wondered why he didn't go around there and says, okay, everything in you be healed. It seemed like that he would have seen, seen that he's got all this power, right? And seen that he's got all this mercy and all this compassion. Didn't do it that way. The Bible says, and a certain man was there, look at this man's condition, which had an infirmity of 38 years. God is concerned when we go through things and, and we've been going through things for a long, long, long time. God is concerned. He wants to make the difference. That's the kind of God that we serve. Then he says, after he knew that he was, had this infirmity for a long time, the Bible says when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that condition or that case, he says to him, do you want to get well? Man could say, what a crazy question. You think I'd be here if I didn't want to get help? He asked him a question. Why would he ask him such a question? Well, I heard a preacher tell about a person that was in his church and they had hurt their neck. I don't know if they, they didn't break it, but they hurt their neck real bad in a car accident. And they had their neck in a brace. They came to church. And the ministry was a healing ministry to heal sick people in conditions. So the person came, but the person didn't want healing from God. So the preacher went to lay hands on him, and the preacher was known for the healing ministry. He said, oh, no, 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 don't pray for me. I got to file a claim. I, I need to, you know. I got to get some insurance out of this deal, you know. So he didn't want to be healed. <laughs> Everybody may not want to be healed. Sometimes a person can enjoy the pity that comes from others. Or let me say it like that. Let me sound it differently. Some people may enjoy the attention that comes from others. Some people can't, don't seem to get any attention until they, have, they go through some hurts or pain or problems or sickness, right? So they may fake it to make it. 
or they may just want to pretend that they're sick to get some attention. But everybody, the point is, everybody don't necessarily want God's healing. I remember we were praying for a person years ago, many years ago, and not a part of this work, but praying for them. They didn't want Jesus' help. Seemed hard to believe, but they didn't want it. Because they said, I don't know what God may require me if I'm healed. I won't have an excuse for some of the things that I'm drawing back from. So they didn't want Jesus' help. I don't know, this man explained his condition. He obviously wanted help. But he was friendless. He didn't have friends, right? Obviously, he was poor. So there are all kinds of conditions, but John points out this one specific condition showing Christ as the mercy seat or a God of mercy and how he looks upon human suffering. Knowing that he had been a long time in that condition, Jesus had compassion, right? And he says to him, do you want to get well? And the, man, the impotent man said, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. So he was dependent upon someone else helping him, right? He did not know, or he obviously was ignorant of Jesus being able to come to him and help him in his state. And so he explained to Jesus, yeah, I want to be made whole, but here's my problem. I don't have anybody to help me. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you didn't really have anybody to help you? Have you ever felt down and out and down on your the way they say it, down on your luck. But he said, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus was about to revolutionize his life. Jesus said to him, rise. Take up your bed and walk. The bed there now, it wasn't like a bed like we, we see and we have. One of these big beds, because you can't take that up and walk with it, right? It wasn't like that. It was a little pallet. A little mat. And uh, so he told him to take it up and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now that's another old sermon when you're dealing with uh, the uh, Sabbath day because the scribes and Pharisees couldn't appreciate this man that was lame of 38 years being healed. It didn't mean a thing to them. They said, you did it on the Sabbath day. But how many know that Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. Are you with me? You know, as he was, he made me see that, uh, just kind of brought that to me again, saying how when the scribes and Pharisees they saw the Sabbath day more important than the people that were to keep the Sabbath. The only problem with that is this. They could not appreciate a person going through they could only appreciate them if they were keeping the Sabbath. So now Jesus come here and just upset their, their, their thinking. Jesus said, now the father actually made this law for the benefit of man. He didn't make man for the benefit of a law. Are y'all seeing the difference? So what we have to see is that the way God sees things. Isn't that right? God would rather help a person even if they fell short than to put the law on them. Well, you ain't doing this. You ain't doing this so so you don't deserve help from God. You ain't, God ain't going to do this until you get this right. God ain't going to do this until you... Now, wait a minute. Jesus didn't operate that way. He came. 
He broke the Sabbath on that day. So they said, you cannot be from God because you violated the Sabbath. She said, okay, you remember David? Remember the showbread was only for the priests? So David and his men, they were hungry. They'd been hungry. They had, you know, they had been in the house of God. They were just hungry, tired, and weary. And he went to the priest and said, hey, you got anything? And he said, well, there's some bread in here. That's all. Give it to me. So David and the men ate. And the Lord said in another text, they were blameless. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Y'all ain't getting this. Okay, let me slow down. What Jesus said when he came, and that's why he frustrated so many of the leaders. Because they didn't understand the mercy that Jesus was showing. Okay, let me go back again. God is a God of mercy. The lame, the impotent, the halt, the withered. God came to that house of mercy to show mercy on a man that was in a hopeless condition. He did charge him, well, don't, go, don't go back and sin or something worse can happen to you. But the idea was it was more important that the father heal this man than to tell him, get it right, and then I'm going to help you. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's why he frustrated him so much because he did things differently. And, uh, but Jesus, the whole point that I think we, we're trying to make here is that God offered hope to a man in a hopeless situation. And you may be here today and you may feel hopeless in some of the things or any of the things that you're going through. But what God wants to do is offer hope. There is hope for your condition. There is hope for you in the midst of it. it whatever you're going through, God wants you to know that there is hope. I'm the master. I made humanity I made the laws. I'm the one that judges whether or not you are qualified to get my help. Right? And so when he sends Jesus on the scene, Jesus is, is a reflection of what the Father wanted to do, of the Father's love for humanity. Right? And so now here's what he does. He takes and uh, he said, do you want to be made whole? Now, the Pharisees was like, okay, notice this is Sabbath day. Don't you dare try to heal nobody because uh, you, that's work. Jesus said a whole lot about the Sabbath day. He was like, no, 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 no. The, the, you know, if you got an ox and he gets stalled and he needs deliverance, how many would just leave him there and say, wait, now let me wait till the next day because this is Sabbath. I can't get him out. Let him stay there. He said, none of you would do that. So is not a man more important than an ox? Okay, I'm not going to drill on that, but I'm trying to, uh, uh, a point that I believe God was just sharing with me and showing me is like, people are more important than rules and regulations. Ah, you missed it. People are more important than rules and regulations. Families, parents, leaders, pastors. People are more important than rules and regulation. Yes, amen. Mercy yes. is the order of the day. Amen. God shows mercy. Hallelujah. And when God's mercy come on the scene, people can get God's help. Nobody just want to be in deplorable conditions. Some conditions people were in, we were in because we caused it ourselves through ignorance, Right? Some we're in because of disobedience and whatever. Some we're in because uh, 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 just a number of reasons. But the whole point is, in order to get God's help, we need to look at it his way. Jesus came to this man who had been suffering for 38 years. There he was, lame. Couldn't help himself. So Jesus comes on the scene and what he does, he says, do you, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to get well? The man didn't know that he was about to be made well. He didn't know that Jesus was the very answer. Jesus was the pool. 
He was the troubling of the water. He, did, he didn't realize that Jesus was all that and he was standing before him and said, do you want to get well? Sir, I ain't got nobody. And then it's like when Jesus said to Mary and Martha, God, I know, I know, Lazarus. I know my brother's going to rise in the resurrection, in the future. I know he's going to do it. Jesus says, look, you looking at the resurrection. You looking at the resurrection. Hallelujah. I'm the resurrection and the life. And didn't I tell you that he that believes in me? If he were dead, he was going to live. What are you saying? In a nutshell, God is a God of hope. And no matter what we go through in this life, there is hope. As long as we have Jesus, there is hope. So there's hope in your situation today. And I want to encourage you, you look up. Don't look at the problem. Look up. Look to the God of hope. Look, at, look to the God of your salvation. God is a God of compassion and mercy. And he knows our condition. That's what he told Moses. I know their sorrows. I know. I know who's oppressing them. I know. And then he says, but I'm coming to deliver. And this is an hour of deliverance. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But we must look to the deliverer. Yeah. It is Jesus Christ. Yeah. God's holy son. Yeah. So I'm going to. I said I would make it short. So I'm going to make it short today. I want to say this to each and every one. God wants us to have hope. Hope. There is always hope. As long as there is breath in your body, as long as there is God, the God of hope, and he's a miracle worker. Don't give up in your situation. Don't lose heart. Don't faint. Don't feel like quitting. Be faithful. Look to the Lord. Hallelujah. God will bring you through it because that's his Specialty. That's his expertise. A God of impossibilities. And he works well. And see, when you know that this is the God you're serving, a God of impossibilities, then your expectation and my expectation must always be in God. And you're in a situation, you don't know how to get out of it. It's all right, God's about to work a miracle in this situation. Why? Because that's the God I serve. He's about to work a miracle in my situation. And as long as I have that hope, then God will do just that. Let's never limit God to our understanding. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I give you praise, just like you did the man at the pool of Bethesda. You want to do to us today. Those that are listening to me by way of television, I ask you now to let that word permeate the minds of those that are listening. And let whatever condition that your people are facing now, and they will begin to see hope, the God of hope. In hopeless situations. When situation says it can't be changed. Let them see God. The God of impossibilities. The God of miracles. The God that truly has compassion on us. At all times. And we'll give your name to glory. And we'll give your name to honor. For it's in Jesus name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. Let's give him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>